Bonjour à tous. Merci, euh, merci d'être venu à midi pour euh, la conférence de, de Justin Turner. Donc, euh, Justine a, a obtenu son baccalauréat en pharmacie et une maîtrise en pharmacie clinique à l'université de South, South Australia et son doctorat à Monash University en Australie. Ensuite, Justine a eu l'occasion de travailler pendant de nombreuses années comme pharmacien clinicien dans plusieurs hôpitaux en Australie et également au Royaume-Uni avant de devenir pharmacien communautaire en Australie euh, méridionale. Dans ce rôle, il a travaillé étroitement avec des médecins de famille et de région et des établissements de soins pour personnes âgées. Et son travail auprès des personnes âgées vivant dans les communautés et les établissements de soins a pour but d'optimiser la gestion des médicaments chez les personnes âgées vulnérables notamment. So, la présentation va être en anglais. Justine. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Bonjour. Bonjour tout le monde, ça me fait un grand plaisir que vous soyez venus. Ma présentation s'agit de Implementation Science, ou la science de mise en œuvre, qui est la science qui examine euh, comment instaurer une évidence ou une preuve à partir d'un contexte ou d'un environnement euh, vers un autre. Aujourd'hui, je vais donner un aperçu de la théorie de mise, science de mise en œuvre actuelle et comme je traduis cette théorie à pratique à travers le Canada. Bien qu'elle soit en train d'apprendre le français, je vais faire mon présentation en anglais aujourd'hui. <laughs> Merci pour votre compréhension. Hello and thank you for coming. It, I'm really excited to be here today and glad that you're here. While I give a presentation about implementation science and how we're moving from theory into practice. So to give an overview, well, what I would like to do today is give an overview of implementation science theory where it stands today, which is really complex, really confusing, so I'm going to try and simplify it into three broad approaches. Those broad approaches are using process models, using behavioral change determinants, and evaluation frameworks. And I want to bring that all home from a theory level to practice level, talking about two of the research projects that I'm doing here, as I'm implementing research from Montreal across other provinces of Canada. So why implementation science? For me, it's really important to understand why similar interventions work or don't work from one setting when we move it to another setting. So I look at it as the magical formula. I've got my little wizard's hats there. I'd love to see the magic of what is going on when we bring science from here to there and how does it work or not work and why so that we can change things. So for example, as you heard, I, I worked in the UK. This here is Whitehaven Hospital up in the northwest of, of England. While I was working there on geriatrics wards, it was not uncommon to find one in four older adults prescribed risperidone, which is an antipsychotic. They weren't prescribed it because they were psychotic, they were prescribed it because they had behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. And we assumed that it would help improve those symptoms. I say assume because in those times there was no evidence to support it. It was off-label prescribing. And one week, I left my hospital and went skiing in Italy and didn't do this skiing. I did this time, however. And when I came back, I was a student enough to realise that there was no one on my ward anymore who was on risperidone. And I found this confusing, going from one in four, one in three patients to zero. So I posed the question, what happened? And everyone said, didn't you hear? And of course, in Italy, I didn't hear. But this is what happened. The UK government, so similar to Health Canada, issued a report that said risperidone and lanzapine should not be used in older patients for dementia because it increases the risk of stroke and death. So in this setting, where we had the consultants and the geriatricians that agreed we should not be using it, the medical students agreed, the pharmacists, the nurses, everyone was agreeing that it is good evidence and we shouldn't do it. Therefore, we didn't, and we changed practice instantly. But later that year, I went back to Australia and started working long-term care facilities. The same report had been released by the government there, and yet what do you think happened? Do you think use had gone from 25% down to zero, like I'd seen in my hospital? Hands up if you think, oui, no, je ne comprends pas. No. A absolutely no change. 
In fact, this graph shows the, the research projects that have been done almost every year in Australia since the beginning of, well, since 20 years ago, to try and reduce antipsychotic use. And as you can see, we start at 24% in 2001 and we finish at 24%. There has been no change. What really personally upsets me is that for these years, I was involved in many of these projects in my nursing homes and we found that we could reduce use of antipsychotics during the project, but as soon as the project finished, everything went back to how it had always been. That is what motivated me to research how do we fix this problem. So the key questions for me today in the presentation are going to be, how can we translate evidence from one country to another? How can we translate from one medication class to another medication class, or is this evidence really specific to one? And how do we go from a very well-controlled randomised trial to the very messy and uncontrolled real world? And how does that impact our research? So I'll start with implementation science is really hard. Some of the research says it takes 17 years to get from what we produce here as researchers, primary, care, primary evidence, takes 17 years to actually change behaviour. And in my research, which is de-implementation, getting people to stop doing what they're doing, it takes even longer. So how do we speed that up? And I think implementation science holds the key. Now, 20 years ago, a report came out in the US and it said 30 to 40% of older adults do not receive appropriate care. In fact, 20 to 25% receive care that they don't need or is inappropriate. Sorry, 30 to 40% receive care that is, is not best evidence. So have things changed in the last 20 years? Who thinks they've changed? <laughs> no, no one. Either that or you don't understand my accent, my apologies. But what about, that was the US. Surely we're better here in Canada. No, yeah, we, I agree. So when we look at medication use, which is my, one of my, one of my pet likes, I'm a pharmacist. One in two older adults is prescribed a medication in Canada that should not be given to older adults. So how do we have this evidence that says it's harmful and yet at clinical practice, 50% of people are still prescribed them. Now that causes a lot of problems. One, we spend $400 million a year funding these medications and one and a half billion dollars funding, fixing the problems the medications caused. So there's a whole load of wastage going on, not lo let alone the personal cost. Now I just want to highlight the benzodiazepines or sleeping pills and proton pump inhibitors or medications for reflux account for six of the top 10 inappropriate medications used in Canada at the moment. So my research here is focusing on benzodiazepines and proton pump inhibitors because we have a long way to improve. So you knew the slide was coming eventually. What is implementation science? It is the scientific study of the methods that we use to promote the systematic uptake. So not just random people doing it here and there, but a systematic uptake of consolidated research findings into routine healthcare practice and health policy in an effort to try and improve patient care and the quality and effectiveness of our health service. So as researchers, I'm going to pose the question, why is it important to us? I think the dream for all of us would be have our research published in science or JAMA and you know, make an impact. I know, I'd be happy uh, one day. So if we want to make our research actually have an impact and change practice, we need to make sure when we're doing our primary research, we consider how this is going to be adapted. It's also good if we want more publications and we want to get more known. But theoretical approaches to implementation science have gone, grown exponentially in the last 20 years. In fact, there's a great quote that once I heard it, I thought it was perfect. Theoretical approaches to implementation science are like toothbrushes. You might say, where is this going? Everyone has their own and no one wants to use anyone else's. <laughs> so the research, unfortunately, is complex. And the terminology we use is ridiculous. There are processes, frameworks, models, theories, determinants, behavioural mechanisms, behavioural change theories. And this research has grown out of sociology and psychology and people like myself, clinician researchers. So we all mean different things when we use the same words. So for today, I want to set the bar and say what I mean so that we're all on the same page. 
So when we're talking about theoretical approaches, process models is one thing we're going to look at. The next I'm going to talk about behavior change determinants, which is how do we change behaviors? What actually at a personal level makes us as a researcher or as a patient or as a physician change the behaviors that we're doing? And then how do we evaluate this? Because evaluation of implementation science goes beyond just the primary outcome of our research, but what worked and what didn't work and how do we improve it for the next round? So for me, I want to put it simple. How would I explain this to my kids? Process models are a recipe. Here we've got Cookie Monster and how to make cookie dough. It's get the ingredients and follow step one, two, three, four, five. It's a process model of how to implement your research into a bigger setting. Whether that be the hospital here, whether it be a hospital down the road, a hospital in Quebec City, dream big, why not go for a province? Why not go for a country? How do we take our research and grow it up? One way we can approach it is to use a process model, a list of ingredients and step by step. But if we make a cake, we want to take it to, how did it work? Was it a good cake? Was it a bad cake? We need someone to judge it. And that's where the evaluation frameworks come in. Well, here, I'm not sure if anyone watches MasterChef. Maybe, maybe not. We need to work out what went wrong or why and how did the cake go. And behavior change determinants, for me, are the magic in the middle, as I said before. It helps explain why the cookbook recipe had a picture that looked like this, and yet my cakes look like that. It's great to know my cake failed, but it would be even better to know why did it fail and how do I make it better. And that's where behavior change determinants fit in. So today, there's two models I want to talk about under the process models. The first one is CIFA, or the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. And you'll see here, as I mentioned before, we use different terminology to mean the same thing. It's a process model, but they called themselves a framework. So I'll refer to the CIFA as a process model, and collective impact as a process model as well. Behavior change determinants, most of the implementation science world now agrees that the theoretical domains framework is a good framework for looking at these. However, it's complex. There's 14 different domains, there's 84 different constructs. So for example, a domain would be knowledge. If we teach our patients, will they do something different? If I teach the physicians, will they do something different? Does imparting knowledge change behavior? But what about belief about consequences? If I think I'm at risk of a fall, is that going to change the way I behave? Or my social and professional role? And I want to talk about two evaluation frameworks. CIFA, as you see, if we use it here as a process model, it helps guide us through how to evaluate that process. So if you use it for process, you can also use it to evaluate. But the other evaluation framework I love is called REAIM, and I'll talk through that and why we've used that in a minute. But before I do that, I want you to think about your research. And what do you think is important for getting your research out of a lab, whether that be here doing MRIs, functional MRIs, how do we translate that to another university or another hospital? Do we think a process model might be important, behavior change, or an evaluation framework? I don't need an answer, but just to get you thinking. Because at the moment, it's, it is a high level theory, but how does it resonate at practice level for us? So I want to show you how Two examples of my research where I've taken it from theory down into practice. I'm going to talk about the tapering trial and the safer meds NL trial. And hopefully get from evidence to practice. So I want to refocus on the key questions I mentioned at the beginning. How do we translate evidence from one, in this case, province to another, one medication class to another, and from the controlled setting to the messy real world? So the first project I'll talk about is the tapering trial where I transferred evidence made here in Quebec to the province of Manitoba. The evidence was created on benzodiazepines and we adapted it to opioids. The evidence worked in a very small pharmacist-led randomized controlled trial and we adapted it to the very messy government-led implementation at a provincial level. And we wanted to see would it work and why not. So the aim of my tapering trial was to evaluate the effectiveness of a government-led mail out of educational information which went to all adult community dwelling chronic opioid users and we wanted to see if we could reduce their opioid use compared to usual care. 
So this is the evidence we started with from Quebec. This is the EMPOWER trial. And the EMPOWER trial, pharmacists provided pa patients with information about their medications, in particular this brochure, that said you may be at risk because you're taking a sleeping pill. And we found when pharmacists gave that information to the patients, 27% of people stopped their medication. So this is my published research, um, the protocol, called tapering, the trial of applying policy to reduce or eliminate narcotics in the general population. And this is what we started with in Quebec, and then we adapted it for opioids. As you can see, it looks a bit different. It went through many, many focus groups here in English and in French to try and make sure the context for people who had chronic pain whether the behaviour change levers in there still resonated. Did they still get the same result when we asked them, would you change medication? So the process model we used for implementing that was called CIFR. Now there's five steps, which I'll run through one by one by one in a bit more detail. Step one considers the components of the intervention. For us, really, adaptability was my key question. Could we adapt it? Because we knew the intervention source, we knew the evidence, because it had been created locally. We knew it was great. But could we adapt it? So adaptation became difficult, maybe. This was the original brochure that went to people in French about their sedative hypnotics or sleeping pills. And then this is the extra information focus groups here asked for on opioids, which says that it takes only one week before you can become addicted. There's nearly 4,000 people dying in 2017 from opioid use across Canada. Canada rank, ranks second highest only to the US for the number of people using opioids. So these facts resonated with the focus groups and they asked us to adapt and put them in. We then need to consider the context of how we go from here to there. There's the outer setting, which is across Canada. The political, the social, the economical contexts in which the organisation resides. Now if you're going from looking at mindfulness for pain control, are we going to scale that up in an organisation that's a government or a province or a hospital? Are we going to look at changing what older adults eat for their diet and how that affects their outcomes here in a hospital or at long-term care settings? So the organisation that we want to implement this in comes with its own context, as does the outside. So here it's the outside. So for my trial, there was an opioid crisis. At that stage, it was really popular. It was in the media with reports like this from the Global News. Every two hours, one Canadian is dying from opioids. So there was a lot going on. Insurance companies in Manitoba started to not fund opioids. So people were getting their access cut off. And there was an urgency created in the press and everywhere else. But if you're scaling up your research, you don't need to consider just the outside population, but also the inner setting. So within the organisation, and for tapering, we had a really well-defined hierarchy with the health minister at the top. We had a government that was motivated to do something and they'd already done some things. They'd created the Manitoba Monitor Drug Review Committee, which was the Pharmacy Association, Medical Association, Nursing Association, Dentistry Association, social workers, everyone involved in people who are addicted to opioids as a think tank to how do we move forward. They'd started to provide free naloxone across the province and they'd had some extra physicians brought in to train primary care physicians and give them support about opioid prescribing. The individuals that are going to be involved in our research also are important. Here, for me, one of the key people was Trish, who was the head of the Provincial Drugs Program. She was keen, it was key, because she also got on board the Health Minister. But we don't need to consider just who is in our organisation, but external to that we can have change champions. In this case for me, the College of Physicians and Surgeons were already striving to change opioid use. So reaching out to them to make sure our intervention aligned with theirs was, was key. Now for me, this change was a very linear process compared to the next project I'll talk about. Going through the steps, just like the recipe with this change model, was a simple thing to do. I say simple, it was complex. There was a lot of steps. Get the Provincial Drug Committee on board, get the Minister on board, get the Manitoba Monitor Drug Review Committee on board, then get the health policy people to give us approval because we weren't enrolling patients. 
So we didn't have informed patient consent. We enrolled a province and the province gave consent for everybody. We then had to identify people, randomize them, print, post, and then look back and see what we did. So that's the first column we talked about, the process. If I look at this from what caused people to change their behaviors, I'm running into a bit of problems because we adapted our materials here and we tried to include some review from indigenous people in Manitoba to make sure that it resonated with them. However, because the government was leading this as a policy, we were forbidden from following up with actual people on the ground during the study to ask, did it change their behavior? Did it change what they think? Why or why not? So did it work? Who thinks it worked? Here we got 27% of people off their sleeping pills. Who thinks changing from sleeping pills to opioids, changing from Quebec to Manitoba, changing from pharmacists to government, who thinks that is going to have no effect and we're going to stop opioid use? Thanks, Cara. <laughs> That's all right. We were sceptical too. So our primary outcomes looked at, could we stop opioid use at six months? Could we get people to reduce the dose of their opioids so at least we know they're coming down? And then we did a post hoc analysis looking at mortality. So sadly, the primary outcome, there was no change. 11% of people in the intervention and the control group stopped their opioids. For me, if I forget to say this later, that's a really amazing context because for the 15 years leading up to this trial, there had not been a reduction in opioid use in Manitoba. So just when my trial starts, the intervention, the control group decides to go down. However, we were able to get 3% of people, thereabouts, to have a dose reduction. And what's really interesting is when we look at the post hoc analysis, when we look at, so we've got on the bottom here, day zero up to day 180 at six months, the death rate, the control group died faster than the intervention group, with 74 Manitobans dying in the control group versus 59 in the intervention. But unfortunately, we can't answer why. And we don't know why the results differed because we weren't able to do that red bit and ask the questions about why did people change behavior. So we then move on to the third step in the evaluation framework. Starting at the bottom, the process went really smoothly and worked as it should have. The context, the individuals involved, we had the right people involved, we were able to do the study. The inner setting in the organisation, the government organisation changed their behaviour and they got things done and we were able to send it out. So why did it fail? Comes back to one of these two. The intervention or the context of the outer setting. So the intervention, I'm left wondering, can we actually adapt from sedative hypnotics to opioids? Or is it that tapering takes longer? So we would have seen a difference had we gone for longer. Or what about the context to the outer setting? There was a lot of naloxone around for the first time in Manitoba's history. Maybe that is why people had a reduction in mortality. But because it was free and not recorded, we have no idea whether people switched to naloxone or picked some up and that's what saved or reduced the mortality. There was a lot of physician support and education. Maybe that context in the outer setting helped physicians feel confident, which is why everybody reduced their opioids. Or for me, what I think is really important is to ask what behavior change techniques or determinants were different? Is it that opioids are more addictive than sedative hypnotics? Or is it that when a pharmacist gives you something, you have trust, but when the government sends you something, maybe we just don't have the same level of trust? Or is it that the opioid crisis wasn't new and everybody knew, so those who were scared and worried about their opioids had already stopped? and we were left with the recalcitrant ones, the ones that were resistant to change. So the strengths of this trial was we had really high level research. We could do a randomized controlled trial and enroll in the entire province. The results were generalizable to the province of Manitoba because they were the province of Manitoba. Not very often I get to say that for a randomized controlled trial, but the weakness was we had no qualitative assessment. So, the process and the evaluation both worked, but the determinants were lacking. Which leads me to my next project. The next project I want to talk about is called Safer Meds NL. The aim of this project is to reduce the prevalence of potentially inappropriate or potentially harmful medicines across the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. 
I'm aiming for a more conservative reduction this time. Last time we said 27%, now we're going for 20. And I'm doing two bits of evidence. Public awareness campaign and expanding the scope of what pharmacists are able to do. So the key questions, if I go back to those, am I able to transfer evidence from this province to Newfoundland and Labrador? From one medication class to another, having learned that the switch didn't work in opioids, we're using sedative hypnotics in Newfoundland as well, but also adding proton pump inhibitors because one in three older adults is taking one. Actually, one in three adults in Newfoundland is taking one. If that doesn't sound like much, on the other side of the country in BC, it's only 8% of adults. So there is a vast difference. So we convinced them that that was worth looking at. We're going from a very controlled setting of a trial to a very messy real world setting and going from a population survey, whoops, sorry, to public awareness. So this part of my presentation is going to have a strong focus on the magic, on behaviour change determinants. So the evidence that we're bringing into play from here and applying over there is twofold. First one, we ran a population survey of older adults who lived in every province and territory of Canada to ask them what they knew about their medication use and what caused them to change or, or start a conversation with their doctor. And the second one was the deprescribed trial, which was a randomised controlled trial ran again out of, out of Montreal, which looked at pharmacists giving patients information, but this time bringing in their family care doctor, their family physician, to see does the double arm approach give us better results than just educating patients alone? So what did we learn from our survey? We learned that two thirds of older adults across Canada know that medications may be harmful. However, only 40% had ever asked their doctor, can I stop a medication? The majority of Canadians have always just taken what they've been told to do. And only 7% have heard the word deprescribing, and that's even less here in, in or any parts of French-speaking Canada, because it's not a common word. It is in the press more now, but at that stage it wasn't. In fact, 7% we thought was high. So what did we learn from this? We learned that patients would actually start a conversation with their doctor in one or two things. If they knew that medication might be harmful to seniors, in that case, they were 75% more likely to go and talk to their doctor and say, hey, should I still be on this? And if they had heard the word deprescribing, they were 55% more likely to go to the healthcare provider and say, is this still the right medicine for me? And as I said, the other bit of education or the other bit of evidence that we're implementing this project, we're going from just pharmacist to patient communication and we're including the family physician which the randomised controlled trial here, the deprescribed trial, where the pharmacist also provided the doctor with evidence-based opinions. Who thinks it reduced 27%, more or less, same as last time? It was better. Bringing the doctor in is much better, we get 43% reduction. So we thought, can we try that in Newfoundland and Labrador? Can we bring in a professional service that doesn't exist there and try and facilitate that collaborative approach to medication use. Now last time I talked about one organisation, the Manitoba government. It was easy to have a linear process and a lovely framework in that setting. This time I don't have one organisation. These are my collaborators. The College of Nurses, Physicians, Pharmacists, I have Seniors Groups, I have the Government, I have Cadeth, I've got Choosing Wisely. I have a ton of stakeholders because in my opinion, all of them have an interest in improving medication safety. So I couldn't use the framework that I talked about before easily, so I had to find another one. Thankfully, there's a plethora of work in implementation science, and I was able to find one that fitted. The process model I picked is called collective impact. There's five key steps. The first one is, does everyone have a common agenda? Do we all agree, in my case, that reducing an appropriate medication is a good idea? Or in your case, do we all agree that improving diet in hospitals is a good idea for older adults? Or adapting that to long-term care settings? Shared measurement. We all agreed, after I showed them the statistics, that they were the highest use of proton pump inhibitors and the second highest use of sedative hypnotics in the country. They all agreed, yeah, we should track that. It would be nice to see that coming down. So it was easy to get them on board there. Mutually reinforcing activities, you want to make sure that the team members are all doing something that works together. It's pointless 
duplicating and it's pointless one person working here, one person working there in two different directions. We need to make sure there's an overlap so that the collective good is greater than the individual parts. We need continuous communication in step four and the backbone support for step five is us as a research team. So just summarising how that worked in my setting, we agreed on the drugs, we agreed we'd monitor the prevalence of medications dispensed. There was a tonne of work that every group was doing individually that we agreed could overlap and work together, and we agreed quarterly stakeholder meetings. So moving on to the determinants of behaviour change. The public awareness campaign, we decided a couple of things needed. We needed to analyse what made people change the medication use, which our survey was one part, qualitative research I've done before is another part, and the systematic reviews of that qualitative work. We needed to bring all the stakeholders together, and my artistic skills aren't great, so I needed a professional advertising company. And this is what they created. So for those who can't read it, it says, Dear Heartburn Medication, we've been together for nearly a year, but it's time to move on. I'm trying to resonate that, as it says at the bottom, for most people, heartburn medication is not recommended for more than three months. Now, it's a great campaign, and people, like my parents, go, wow, that's really pretty. But they don't realise the agony I went behind to make that. So if you bear with me, I'm going to drag you through the agony to show you how you can do awareness campaigns from your research, because I don't know your research. It's different to mine. But I want to give you some ideas of the frameworks that are taken. What we'd found was that if people had social professional role or identity, or if they learnt something new, or if they thought they were able to make a behaviour change, or they were motivated or given a goal to aim towards, or there was some social influence, they would change their behaviour. Now, this is where it gets complex. Apologies if I lose you, I will summarise. So there was a group of experts that looked at a couple of systematic reviews, textbooks, and then did a Delphi process to say, in the published research for the last 40 years, how have we managed to change people's behaviour, whether that be a patient, healthcare provider, government, whoever we're trying to work with. And the top one here is, let's give them a target, or a goal, or let's monitor. We frequently monitor what physicians prescribe. That's one behaviour change technique. So this is theories that have worked. They took it a step further, and I mentioned before there are 14 domains in the theoretical model of how we can change behaviour. And they put 11 of them and they said, let's map these against those 11. I won't explain why they left the three right now. And this is the complexity they came up with. Let me walk you through it on one example. The example here, because you can't read it, says social processes of encouragement, pressure and support, which sounds to me like a public awareness campaign. So I thought, fantastic. There are some white dots here where they agree that there is evidence showing if we use these behavioural nudges or behavioural change techniques, we can change people's behaviour. I'll highlight them for you. The first one says, social professional role and identity is good at making people change their behaviour. I mean, hey, that sounds like what we found in our qualitative work. If someone believes that they're able to change, they're likely to, using this technique. If we motivate them or give them goals of what they should do, they're likely to change their behaviour. And if they're social influencers, they're likely to change their behaviour. And then the one at the end here is emotion. It's got stripy lines saying that they had no idea. The expert Delphi consensus said, we don't know if emotion's going to change behaviour, but no research is done. We're not sure. So let me step you through how we built this, or how I built this, because this is not what the advertising company did, but this is how I dissected it. We have social and professional role and identity here by saying that it shouldn't be used for more than three months. Now this one fact caused me more grief than you can imagine. Because the medical association and doctors told me, you're blaming me for prescribing too much. They really took that as their professional role. <laughs> and I showed up at the pharmacy association, you're blaming me for dispensing too much. Like, oh, okay, I, I wasn't blaming you, it's a fact, sorry. And then I took it to seniors groups and patient groups and they oh, you're blaming us for asking doctors to prescribe medications when we don't need them. We should just fix our diet and exercise. I mean, well, I, again, I wasn't blaming anyone. But it was amazing how this actually generated and really resonated that their social role as a patient or professional role as a pharmacist or doctor really struck home with this campaign. 
We also had belief about the capability. We motivated them saying, you've done it before in other settings, you can make change in this setting too. Social influences by saying, go and talk to your doctor or your pharmacist or your nurse practitioner about this. And emotion. People sort of resonated with the whole idea of breaking up with the medication. One, someone in BC once said, the joy of getting a prescription is like the joy of marriage. The joy of losing your prescription is like divorce. You really don't want to lose it. So this really resonated with our focus groups. Now this is this year's campaign, which is sleeping pills. I won't spend as long explaining the steps, but we chose to use a different process. Here we've gone with persuasive communication because it builds on belief about consequences. It builds about motivation and goals. Are you motivated to do something? Knowledge is successful. Or knowledge, there wasn't enough evidence. The Delphi consensus group didn't agree. And emotionless said, no, that'll never work, but I'd learnt from my first group that definitely works in the context and setting of Newfoundland and Labrador. So how did that work out? Shall we grandma with a sleeping mask if she's still asleep the morning after, trying to walk down the stairs, created an emotional pull with everyone in our focus groups. The big warning, the wake up, was again emotional. We gave them knowledge that sleeping pills may cause more harm than good and that they can increase the risk of falls. And we gave them some goals for patients in particular. Go and talk to your healthcare provider, see if you should be on them or not. Because some people, they are necessary and some people we can perhaps stop. Now quickly step through mindful of time. Pharmacists provided education. We know that it works, but let's look again. We're looking at behavior change terminants. What did my focus groups tell us? Pharmacists said we will change behavior if we think it's our role. We will change behavior if you pay me to do it, because that gives me the time. And we'll do it if we understand what we're doing and why. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, we worked with the government to expand the scope of care. The government reallocated funding to pay pharmacists to do this service and education was provided. So when we're working with healthcare providers, if you're trying to change the way that dietitians recommend something or the way that we do MRI and get the technicians to do functional MRIs, if we're trying to change what's prescribed or how we treat pain, when it comes to healthcare providers, it would appear we're much simpler. That may or may not be true. So how am I implementing this? I'll skip through this, but this is the re-aim framework, and it really focuses on reach, efficacy, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. So reach is what proportion of the target population participated in the intervention. So for me, who in Newfoundland and Labrador heard about this? You assess it at the individual level, and for me, I'm doing population surveys, looking at pharmacy claims data, and working with stakeholders. When I look at efficacy, let's define as what is the success rate if it's done properly? If what I did here in my evidence in, in Montreal is done properly there. Again, it's an individual level assessment. And again, I'm using population surveys to understand what people are doing, linked services and dispense records to see what healthcare providers are doing, and some focus groups. Adoption. What proportion of settings or providers are actually doing this? Now this is at an organisational level. So for me, that's a little bit tricky because there's multiple organisations. But I'm working with large pharmacy chains like Shoppers Drug Mart or Pharmapri to say, in your organisation, have you been able to implement this professional service? So we've got organisational surveys, we've been focus groups with healthcare providers, we've been able to adapt what pharmacy students were gonna do on placement to really focus on this and collect qualitative and quantitative data for us. And implementation stands for what is the intervent to what extent is the intervention implemented as it was intended in the real world? Because we know people adapt things. Even in the original trial I showed you, 25% of pharmacists didn't use the form we gave them. They came up with their own form because in their setting that worked better. So how are we going with the fidelity to it? And again, it's organisational and individual. And I've got surveys, focus groups, and professional services data claim and maintenance. To what extent is the intervention sustained? Now I put this one up because this is what I don't want to see, but when a project in Australia which was prompting pharmacists to reduce proton pump inhibitors, sound familiar, was implemented, at 30 days everybody was doing it, the first day everyone was doing it, 30 days later no one was doing it. So it was an amazing project, we made a lot of change, but 30 days later life got busy and we all forgot. What I'm hoping to see 
is that we get a steady increase. Which is what has been happening, but not fast enough, in my opinion. So here I'm looking at healthcare provider focus groups, and again I'm using linked data for a population level. So a summary, I have a, a, ma a matrix, matrix? Sorry, I can't say them French or English, of, of how we're evaluating this. The primary outcome, I'm sure you're wanting to know, did we reduce proton pump inhibitor use? And I have to say, invite me back next year, because we don't have the data yet. So the strengths and weaknesses of this approach is it's very rich in qualitative data. It's a very much a real world setting. And because of the qualitative data, it's allowing us to adapt and learn. So the focus groups with pharmacists and pharmacy students showed there were some problems in the way the government implemented their policy. So for year two, we've changed that to free up the workflow and make things work better. And we're hoping to see that year two is an improvement on year one. The weakness, it's an interrupted time series analysis. So it's not as strong as far as evidence as a randomized controlled trial. And as much as I would love to tell every one of those multiple stakeholders what to do, it's beyond my power to actually force them to do A or B. So the same problem I'm having accessing data from the government, uh, choosing wisely Newfoundland and Labrador is having the same problem because they were supposed to come out doing audit and feedback to physicians about the benzodiazepine use, and that's supposed to happen now. But there is a glitch in the data which has delayed them. So it's delaying one of my stakeholders, and that's something we have to adapt with and work with in the project. So for here, just to highlight, we use collective in practice the process model, behaviour change, we looked at the, determ the therapeutic determinants framework, and the evaluation framework we used was REAIM. So where do we go from here? I've learned a lot, and where do we go? For me, there's a couple of big things. Collaboration with the Quebec government. I've got some projects um, under review at the moment with large health systems like the VA in the, U in the US to say, can we adapt this to the veteran affairs? I'm on a group where we're actually doing that at the moment. And we've been approached by some insurance companies to say, we want to reduce those original statistics of cost of medication and cost of harms. How do we adapt this for our, for our insurance companies? In Quebec at the moment, with Bill 31 under review, I think there's a huge potential, Bill 31 for the non-pharmacists in the room, is where we're looking at increasing the scope of practice for pharmacists. And as I've clearly seen in Newfoundland and Labrador from preliminary evidence, just telling someone they can do it doesn't mean they will do it. So if that bill passes here, how are we going to use an implementation science approach to scale up and effectively implement what pharmacists are able to do? And beyond that, my research or implementation science doesn't just relate to me as a pharmacist, it relates to everyone in this room as a healthcare researcher. So I'm looking for collaborations to say, how can we work together to bring implementation science theory into a reality as you scale up research that you've done that was successful? And I'm hoping to use my background in healthcare, primary care and long-term care and acute care to say, how can we adapt to the different contexts and environments and some of the struggles we might have? So I posed at the beginning, did you think that a process model or behaviour change determinants or an evaluation framework was more important for you? I'm hoping <coughs> I might have convinced you that neither is more important, they're all equally important, but they're not all feasible and possible and practical. So to summarise, at the beginning, you need to choose a process model that works in your context for your research in the environment in which you're using it. If you can, try and identify before you start what some of the behaviour change theories are, or behaviour change <coughs> determinants, how are we going to motivate change for practitioners, for patients, for organisations, for the hierarchy in the hospital, for the owner of the long-term care facility, wherever our project is going. And then we need to design at the beginning an implementation evaluation so that along the way we can check, are we meeting and doing what we should be doing? Second to last slide. Acknowledgements. Obviously, I've had a lot of funding agencies, CHR, MyTax, the Manitoba government, and the Newfoundland and Labrador government. I want to thank Professor Cara Tannenbaum, my research team, many of whom are here in the front, or photos up there. So we've got Camille, Isabel, Annie, Jenny, and Philippe. Trish, I need to thank, who was instrumental in helping me negotiate the organisation that was Manitoba government. Kelda, who is my research assistant on the ground in Newfoundland and Labrador, who 
is tirelessly keeping this together and moving forward, and of course the numerous stakeholders you saw before. So merci pour ton attendance, and any questions? something positive than just trying to evolve. Not yeah. always uh, more effective, but maybe it's part of the solution. That is true. I'll repeat that for the, for the microphone. So the question was, we're focusing a lot on the negatives of behavior change. These medicines are harmful, these medicines are ineffective, or in proton pump inhibitors unnecessary. Should we be focusing on the positives, like what else can you do? And yes, so the, the behavior change booklet you saw, the first page is to try and create cognitive dissonance that, wow, they're not as safe as I thought. And from a realist evaluation, which is where we go down to the nitty gritty determinants of what made people change behavior in that study, it was finding that as new knowledge was one of the key changes. But learning something is bad and don't do it doesn't get you to the end result. Telling my kids don't run doesn't stop them running unless I say, don't run, let's skip. And then the, my daughter's, yes, I will skip. So very much, yes, providing an alternative. So the educational materials that we hand out have what alternatives can you do? So the advertising per se at the moment is trying to make people aware that they should do something. But the work we're doing in Newfoundland and Labrador is providing healthcare providers with skills on what to do instead. And one of the projects that we have maybe, hopefully, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, just been funded in a different province is to actually help provide cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia to patients, so we use a similar approach for saying these medicines may not be good, but here is the best evidence of what you should do, and we're going to give you a book or hook you up with a healthcare provider that can do something better than what you're currently at. So at the moment, I haven't been fortunate enough to find a funder that will do that until very, very recently. But I have two projects under review, one of which I'm hoping has just been accepted to definitely provide that as the next step. But we've found, or I've found personally, saying to someone, hey, there's an alternative to taking a quick and easy sleeping pill and it's six weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy. People don't see why they would change without that first initial. Perhaps you shouldn't do that because, and then they're more late. So yeah, it is complex. Well, it's really the cost-benefit analysis exactly. that, that leads you to eventually leave the change. So providing only the, the harm isn't providing the benefit. Um, for, for EPP we've been struggling and I really struggled with this as a healthcare provider because a lot of people take them because they're relatively safe and effective. And my PhD was pharmacoepidemiology saying there is association with harm and at a population level there is but at a personal level it's very difficult to contextualise. So there the behaviour change we worked with healthcare providers was to say it's not that they're necessarily bad just why give someone a pill that they don't need? If they can come off it and that message given, we gave a presentation to 400 seniors across the province and they said, I would love to stop medications, are there more that I don't need that I could stop? And it was more there the process of how to stop without getting the return of symptoms or withdrawal symptoms. And the education focus there has been to gradually reduce and what to do to cover it. And the main focus hasn't been that bad, it's been we can stop withdrawal symptoms return in, in a large proportion of people, but they can be controlled, prevented and, and overcome. The context change per drug class. Sorry. 
Um, I got intrigued by Joe Paul's results, so 74 died and 45 survived. But based on the presentation, that really comes in line with biasing towards the fact that deep prescribing gives you more life. <laughs> I was wondering what other parameters we actually consider as potential parameters that could increase the death rate. That is a very good question. So the question from the microphone is, it was great to see that mortality reduced in, in the intervention group where we were able to educate patients about manitoba use. Why was that the case? We're not really sure. We did a continue to extract data to say, did patients go and see their family physician more or less? No, that was the same. So we thought maybe the hypothesis, we educated them, they go and see their physician and their physician either a says, let's reduce your opioid, which we didn't see evidence of. Or B, here's some free naloxone so that you're safe. Or C, now you're here, let's check your blood pressure. Wow, it's through the roof. Let's give you an antihypertensive and we prevent you death dying from something else. So it could be one or the other. They're the hypothesis which, as far as we can tell from interrogating the data, um, we haven't been able to find that. So it could be there's an increase in awareness of there's naloxone there and I'm on something that may be harmful. Some of the extra material that the focus group asked us to add but wasn't in the original trial was that combining opioids with sleeping pills or illicit opioids or alcohol increases the risk of overdose and death. So maybe people change behaviour based on that fact. Uh, I wish I could tell. When we looked further into mortality that was the coroner reports on who died from opioids, the reduc there were less people dying from opioid overdose than what we saw in all-cause mortality, obviously, but they are sealed and there is no way of unsealing those names to link back to our population data, even with government approval. So we're uncertain as to whether it was a reduction in opioid mortality or all-cause due to something else. But good question. I've spent a year trying to find that answer. It's a biased question from my background in kinesiology, but what's the place of physical activity to help people decrease their medication? Because the, we know that it's, it's good to decrease depression, increase the quality, oui. increase the whole aspect of our life. So how uh, do you use uh, physical activity with the, as a good argument for, for the doctors? And if yes, like, is it well received? So there's a two-part question for the microphone. One, we know that exercise from a kinesiologist's perspective is great at reducing blood pressure, depression, and therefore we can come off medications. And two, is that something we've built into our research? So A, I would completely agree. We added at the request of the focus groups here and one of the pain specialists we worked with an extra six, seven pages on how to do a improve exercise, how to gradually improve, how to implement active living into our education brochure that went out to patients. It originally was a separate brochure, but all the participants said, no, that is vital, we need it together. So that was built in there, but as far as working with the government as our research partner, there wasn't any willingness to improve access to physiotherapy or subsidised gym memberships. However, I believe that is a really important question, so I'm currently again have another research project under review this time in Australia where we're working with a physiotherapy group, hospital based physiotherapy group that focuses on lower back pain. And we're trying to do a joint project where they bring the expertise on movement, rehabilitation, exercise, program writing, and I'm bringing in the excess. The other side which is how do we reduce opioid use or medication use. Um, the deprescribed trial also looked at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and another painkiller. So are we able to modulate medication use by providing some very good care and, and ex structured exercise programs? So that is hopefully going to be reviewed by the end of the year and we'll find out if that's successful because I believe that is a huge, huge thing, we, the next step. I'll ask Tan first. <laughs> so, is there, so you talked about approaching the, uh, the healthcare providers. Is there any evidence that actually training healthcare providers on the, uh, the best practices on prescribing or on treating sleep problems, for example, has any effect on the, on the rate of the sleep? Because I mean, for sleep, for example, we know that there's, uh, there's a very strong lack of uh, training in health professionals 
I mean, see many from the TV some, uh, and there are some continuous verification of treaties, but that no physician is paid to, to them. So, what's the impact of trading with physicians or providers on those policies? So, the question is, what's the impact of training healthcare providers and physicians on how to do the alternate therapies, how to manage sleep properly? Sadly, I'd say very, very little. So the, the most common technique we use is audit and feedback. So it would be prescribing, here's your prescribing rates. They're really high compared to your peers. Perhaps you need to reduce your use. So that level of work works really well if it's ordering blood tests, if it's ordering urine cultures, if it's doing those things, really effective. When it comes to prescribing, or more so de-prescribing, it's largely ineffective with an effect size of about 5% according to the Cochrane Review. When it comes to providing education at a continuing education level where people can choose to come or not come, it sort of gets diluted further. So while it is, let's educate you, it may or may not work. There are exceptions. So in Saskatchewan, we're talking with the RX Files, which has been an academic detailing group running for the last 15, 20 years, where they go and see face to face with the physician and present their data and present the current evidence and work through how can you approach some of these patients and work through an individual patient plan. That is very effective, but very time intensive and very expensive. So Manitoba government did a similar thing called the Reaim uh, Reach project, but they got rid of it after three years because it cost too much. So our interventions in Newfoundland and Labrador, we're working with Choosing Wisely who already does that and we're trying to provide a few extra opportunities. But um, c'est difficile. Yeah, it's probably more something that you can measure only in long term. And, and right. if you actually act uh, early enough in the training, for example, if you travel with medical schools and you have mm -hmm. professionals, and for that, the effects will only be seen 10 years down. 10 years down, yeah. Uh, because, yeah, if you're, if you're a practitioner, you have your habits for now 20 years yeah. to do the training, because that's what we used to do. It's more to see, yeah. Yeah, so we're currently writing a white paper to how should we educate physicians, pharmacists, nurses, nurse practitioners about the importance of deep prescribing. Mm -hmm. Because it's easier to get someone off a drug if they've never started it. Just yeah. as it's easier to get someone off cigarettes if they never started smoking. So if we can get the appropriate prescribing message there. And for me, I think from my practice experience, starting with the end in mind, if you're starting with an opioid, we've just got a preliminary study in, in Ontario has just shown that telling people post-surgery you're going to have three days of opioids and that's it because your pain should be better by then, reduced opioid use and opioid prescribing significantly because people were primed for an appropriate duration and knew at the beginning that it was going to stop. So I completely agree education has to change from what we've done and we're trying to look at nuances about to how to approach appropriateness from the beginning either starting or talking about stopping. Sorry, Kara. <laughs> um, Justin, hopefully you've inspired people to take some of the research that they've been doing and maybe bring it to Grand Echelle or scale it up or go to another setting and tell someone to use it. But Hopefully. we often don't know who to talk to or who the Trish is who will be able to influence everyone in the other organization. Can you share maybe one or two tips about your instinctive ability to identify um, decision makers with influence and how to establish relationships with them so that they become the voice for your project. Thanks, Kara. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so for those on the microphone, Kara said, how do you identify the, the external change agent, as the, the theory would use, and how do you convince them that my project is better than everyone else's and we really have to do it because it's super important? Um, I've asked a few of the governments that and they say one of the key strengths that I possess is persistence. Bringing the data that is actually relevant, doing the background to show this data is relevant to your context, your organisation, your setting, but being persistent. For example, in Newfoundland and Labrador, I went there, was invited to go and give a presentation to the pharmacy school about deprescribing and I saw there was a little bit of an opportunity that invited me from flew me from here or there to talk about it, there must be an interest. I was involved with some research in New Brunswick about reducing antipsychotics, and you were nurse there, 
who'd come from Newfoundland and Labrador. So I reached out to her, she put me in touch with her government people who put me in touch with their ADM, who put me in touch with their ADM, who said, well, it's not nursing, it's pharmacy, and eventually got passed through to the right channel. So had I given up at the first hurdle, I would have been in trouble. So persistence is one key. Doing the background of, is it actually a priority at the moment? So I'm meeting with Saskatchewan government in a couple of weeks to say, what are their priorities on the appropriate use of medications? And where do we have research knowledge that fits with those priorities and then how can we move that forward so it's difficult I don't know there's a clear answer apart from know your research well which I assume you will do it's your research um, find where the gaps are where it could improve patient care by looking at the data that says patient care is not actually up to speed and could be improved and then find someone in the organization who can help give you the roadmap to the right person Question. Oui. How do you deal with the industry? Because of course you're facing <laughs> the youth industry and also how do you deal with the potential uh, activists that will be very favorable to your goals but may not... Uh, Maybe on the extreme pendulum swing. Oui. So two questions. How do I deal with the industry and how do I deal with the activists that love the idea but may not be on my same wavelength? Um, number one one of the medication classes we originally were looking at when I came to Quebec four years ago was sulfonylureas, long-acting sulfonylureas, because we have Canadian evidence that shows if we start an older adult on these versus any other oral diabetes medication, they're more likely to end up in hospital in three months' time. So there's a lot of safer alternatives. And we were brainstorming, what do we do, Karen? How do we approach this? Is the same technique going to work? But the industry beat us to it by saying, our new drugs are better, that one is bad. And with the might of their advertising dollar and their influence, the drug is gone. So we can, can, we can say, yes, in the time I've been here, that drug has ceased to exist, but unfortunately not through our effort. When it comes to promoting, aggressively promoting a, a drug, um, it is difficult. At the moment, with opioids being maybe not so good and the use coming down, we're seeing the exact opposite upward trend in gabapentinoids which there's no evidence that they work, but there's some very good push from somewhere. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where, because it's sure not healthcare providers. So it is a difficult thing to overcome. And like Tan said, we're trying to nip that in the bud now. And a meeting with Kai Hai last year, we were extracting that data along with their opioid data to try and provide that and say, hey, look, this is an emerging trend. It's two years in the making. Let's stop it here. So that's the industry. The other bit, every time, and I guess this goes hand in glove, Every time I give a presentation, here, healthcare providers, researchers, pharmacists, and definitely with community dwelling people, someone will come up to me, I'm on too many medications. I think mum's on too many medications. That really resonated. How do I go about it? So I think a lot of, we realize there is maybe a big problem that's systematic. And I think people are getting on board. Some of them, one dear lady at my public awareness talk in Newfoundland and Labrador, the first one, told me that she was on 26 medications. A year later, we repeated the talk, 400 people in the room, and she came up, I stopped all of them. I went, oh, with your doctor? By myself. And I went, I have failed. <laughs> so that year I changed my talk to speak to your healthcare provider. Hence it is in bold in all of our advertising to make sure that it is done properly and safely and not enthusiastically, maybe naively. We. Oui. Oui. And for EPP, if we stop them abruptly, you get rebound symptoms. So the biggest failure, in fact, talking with the government group about how we were structuring the implementation and evaluation in their system, three of the people in the group said, oh, I stopped one of those, heartburn came back, I'm never doing that again. So I went, how did you stop it? Well, oh, just because I wanted to. Donc, that is the big evidence piece we're trying to impart there. Hello, merci beaucoup. Sorry for running out of time.